The purpose of this video is to explain the guidelines for the exams. Before getting started, however, there are a few preliminary points that I need to make about this video. The video you are about to watch was originally made for a section of this class that ran in the spring semester of 2021. For that reason, the specific exam dates that I discuss in this video will not match the exam dates for your particular section. Furthermore, the possible essay questions you see on the study guides in this video may be slightly different from the possible essay questions that are on the actual study guides for your class and your section. However, the general points about the format of the exams, where to find the study guides for the exams, how to take the exams, and how I will grade your exams still apply to your section. Now, to find the precise exam dates for your section and the exact essay questions you will need to be prepared for, please consult the Blackboard page for our class, the syllabus, the weekly instruction letters, and the exam study guides that are posted online. In addition, if there's anything in this video you find confusing or need clarification on, then please do not hesitate to contact me via email. Welcome to Philosophy 1301, Introduction to Philosophy. In this video, I'm going to provide further explanation of the most significant type of assignment that you have in this course, and that is, of course, the two exams that we will take in this class. Now, the first thing to do will be to give you a general idea of when these exams will take place and what they will be covering. And for this, we should consult the syllabus. So let's go ahead and open up the syllabus on Blackboard. And if we go to the course schedule, to see when the first exam will take place, we have to go to week nine. So during week nine, which is the week of March 15th, you will have the opportunity at some point during that week, at some point from Monday through Friday, right? There'll be no other content, there'll be no other readings or videos to watch. That week will be totally devoted to the exam. And at some point during that week, you will be required to open up the exam program and to submit your exam. And that program will become available to you on Monday the 15th at 8 a.m. And it'll close, you won't be able to access it anymore um, on the Friday the 19th at the end of the day. So you have that five-day period to submit your exam. And also, uh, exam one is going to, of course, cover everything in the first half of the course. And exam two, which takes place at the end of the semester during final exam week, uh, during week 16, which is the week of May 3rd, has the exact same format as we will discuss, and also exam two is not cumulative, right? So exam one just covers everything in the first eight weeks in the first half of the class, and exam two covers everything in the second half of the class. And just like exam one, you'll have an entire week or a five-day period to, um, in which you can work on and have an opportunity to open up the exam program. That program will become available to you on Monday the 3rd at 8 a.m. and it will close on Friday the 7th at the end of the day. Okay, so that's the basic time frame of the exam. But of course there's a lot to explain about format, how to study, and that sort of thing. And the thing you should know and what is going to be crucial, absolutely crucial to your success on the exam is to know that there are, is a study guide for each exam. So let's get, take a look at that study guide, and I'll show you two places where you can find the exam study guides. And just so you know, I'm only going to go over exam one in this video because nothing changes in terms of format or how the program will work or the time frame, right? Nothing changes between exam one and two. The only thing that changes is the content. So I'm just going to go over the exam one study guide, and everything I say about it can also be applied to the exam two. Okay, so the first place you can find the exam one study guide is in the syllabus and course resources area. So if you click on this link, that would bring up the study guide. The second area you can find the study guide is if we go to course content and we scroll down to week nine where the exam is taking place, you'll be able to find the study guide there. And if you scroll down to the end, you'll see week 16, you can find the exam two study guide there. So let's go ahead and open up the exam week and let's take a look at the study guide. Okay, so first let's start with a few points about the format. The format of both exams will be exactly the same. 
you will be required to respond to two essay prompts and each of those essays will be worth 100 points. That means the exam altogether is worth 200 points or 25% of your total grade and both exams together are worth 400 points or half of your total grade. Now, the first thing I'll say is that because this is the case, the exams represent an extremely large and extremely significant portion of your grade. And this means it's very critical that you take them very seriously. Each exam in and of itself is worth 12 and a half, or excuse me, each essay in and of itself is worth 12 and a half percent of your total grade. So to just slack off on one essay is, could really have a serious negative effect on your overall performance in this class. So of course you should take all the assignments seriously, but you really need to pay extra attention to the exams and devote the amount of time to them that the amount of points that are worth deserves. Okay, so like I said, the format for each is that you respond to two essay prompts. Now, how this will work is that during exam week, the program on Blackboard that administers the exam will become available to you. And when you open up that program, it is going to give you two randomly selected uh, essay questions from the study guide. So a couple things to say here. First, where can we find the possible essay questions? Well, if we scroll down, we can see here starting on page two that we're going to start seeing the essay prompts. So here's the first essay prompt, the first possible one you could see in the exam. Here's the second one. Here's the third. And if we continue scrolling down, you would see that there are six, for exam one, there are six total essay prompts. So you will see two of those prompts and the two you see will be randomly selected, which means the ones you see may very well be different from the prompts that uh, one of your other classmates sees. Okay, so one thing to take away from this, and I'm going to, um, a little later on in this video, I'm gonna walk you through a prompt and just sort of give you an idea of what I'm expecting and how I'll be grading you. But one thing to take away from this at the very beginning is that all six of these essay prompts are available to you right now. Right, the exam at this point is roughly eight weeks away, um, at least at the time I'm recording this video. Right, so the exam itself is a good chunk of time away but all the essay prompts are currently available to you, which means you can start preparing for the exam extremely early. And in fact, this is the idea I have in mind behind how I've structured the exam, right? So instead of waiting till the last minute um, when the exam is due in a few days and trying to do all the essays then, you could prepare these es your responses to these essays in advance as we proceed throughout the semester, right? So for instance, the first essay covers Socrates' criticism of Euthyphro's third definition of piety. Well, once we cover that material in lesson two, once we're done covering that, the material will be most fresh in your mind. You will have just done the lectures, you will have done the discussions, maybe the response paper, right, depending on whether you choose to do that one or not. But in any case, the material will be most fresh in your mind. And so you could go ahead and write out a draft to this essay response at that time. And then you can continue as the semester proceeds, just gradually working on the essay prompts and your uh, responses to these possible essays. And if you did that, imagine the situation you'd be in once we actually got to the exam week. You would already have six essays written out. Maybe you'd want to go back and proofread them. Maybe you'd want to expand on certain points, tighten things up, but basically most of your work would be done. And think about how much less stressful that exam week would be when I imagine you probably have other classes that also have exams around that same time, whether it's a midterm or in fact uh, during final exam week. So I, so I really do recommend that you begin to prepare early. Um, and this also allows if you are stuck on any questions, um, there's anything in the prompts you don't understand, you can contact me and I'm more than willing to help. Uh, help you work through those issues and point you to the areas in your responses where they might need more development. So overall, I really do encourage you to take advantage of, of the format, take advantage of the fact that all the essays are available to you, and really work toward preparing in a slow, gradual, and consistent manner. So now that we have covered the exam format, we should say a few things about how you actually submit your exam. Now, as I told you, you're going, when the exam week comes around, you'll have a period of five days in order to, to open the program and submit your exam. That period will start on the morning of Monday of that week and end at the end of the day on Friday. 
Now, I'm going to show you what the program looks like in a minute and what that process will be like, but the most significant thing about this system is that when you open up the program, you'll notice that you only have 20 minutes to submit your responses to the questions that have been randomly selected for you. And you might say, well, wait a minute, 20 minutes does not seem like enough time to answer these questions. A lot of those prompts were pretty detailed and had multi-part answers, so how can I get that done in 20 minutes? And the answer, of course, is that you can't get that done in 20 minutes, or at least not well, right? And this is actually intentional. The idea, as I said previously, is that you have been preparing for this, this exam um, well in advance, and by the time you open that program, or let me put it this way, before you open the exam program, this is very important, before you open the exam program, have all your responses to the possible essay questions written out and completed and ready to submit, formatted just the way you like. And what that means is, before you open the exam program, you absolutely must have six different documents, one with an answer to each, uh, each document being an answer to one of the possible essay questions. And then when you actually open up the program, all you're going to have to do is find the file on your computer, upload it, and then submit it. So the 20 minutes, you shouldn't actually need anything close to 20 minutes. The whole process really, if you've got all the work done, should really take less than a minute or two. And again, the idea is that by the time you get to the exam week, or certainly before you open up the exam, all the work will be done. And once you open up the exam, you're really just submitting your documents. Okay, now to show you what this will look like, I'm actually going to take you through an example of how the exam program works. Um, so again, we're in the week of exam one, and let's go down to this program right here. Now, if you go on Blackboard right now to the exam one week, you won't be able to see this because it's not actually available to you um, until, until March 15th at 8 a.m., but in my instructor view, I can see it. So this is what will be available to you when that week comes around. Okay, so let's say you've written out all your possible responses. You have them on six different documents ready to submit. They're completed and formatted just the way you want them to be. Then you click on the exam program. When you click on this, it'll give you some specifications about the exam. It's going to tell you there's a time limit of 20 minutes. It's going to tell you that the test will automatically, when that 20 minutes is up, submit and save whatever you have. Right, so when you are sure you're ready to begin, you have all the answers completed, I know I can't say it enough, when you have all the answers completed, then you click begin. And right here, this is the first um, possible essay question that has been chosen for me on this um, time doing the exam from the study guide. And notice that this essay question that you're looking at here is taken word for word from the study guide. There will be no changes, right? The exact essays you see on the study guide are the exact possible things that you could see on the exam. Okay, so this is the question I've been given. So now, okay, I'm gonna browse local files and find my response I've already prepared. So let's say this is my document with my response. I upload that and then I move to the next question. Here's the next essay prompt that was chosen for me. Again, browse local files, find your response, upload it. And then once you're confident that you have the, um, the answers how you want them, and also once you're confident that you uploaded answers that are actually the questions you were asked, right? You don't wanna upload an answer that's to a different question than the one that the exam chooses for you. Once you're confident in all that, and again, you can check that, you can click on what you uploaded and you can actually see your answer. It'll come up just to, so you can be confident and make sure you've submitted the right thing. Uh, you should also be able to go back if you want to and check on that one. But once you are sure that you've answered both questions uh, to the best of your ability and the way you want, then you click Save and Submit. And it's pretty straightforward. Once you've done that, then you've completed the exam. So again, the process isn't that complicated. It should not take you long at all once you open the program, but I know I've said it a million times, I'm going to say it again. Do not open the exam program until you have all your possible responses uh, written out and formatted in the way you would like to submit. 
To complete this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to respond to the prompts and also give you some insight into how I will grade your responses. So first, um, there's a couple things to say about what I'm looking for in your responses. And there's really two main criteria I use to evaluate and give you a grade. First, do you completely answer the prompt? That is, do you give an answer to every single question or every single point that is mentioned in the essay prompt? And this is sort of a baseline for my grading because of course if there's some portion of the question that you leave unanswered or you leave unaddressed, well there will be a certain number of points attached to that part of the question and if there's no answer to it, it just means you'll get a zero for that part of the question. There is of course partial credit, um, so that doesn't mean you won't get any credit, it just means for that part of the question, you will not get any credit. So the first thing is completeness. Do you answer everything? And then the second higher standard of course is accuracy and understanding. Do you show me that you truly understand the material? Do you explain it in your own words? Do you use good examples? Do you make reference to the text where necessary? Do you show you have a mastery of the material? Those are the two things I'm looking for. Now to help you here, I want to walk you through one of the possible prompts and just give you some guidance as to what you're looking at and how you should approach answering it. So here's the first possible essay prompt from the exam one study guide. The first thing you'll notice here is that there's this sort of title right here and you might wonder, well do I have to re provide a response to this and the answer is no, that's just a title or a topic sentence that sort of tells you what the topic of the question is and ties everything together. So you don't have to provide a response to that. What you do need to provide a response to is everything in part one and everything in part two. You'll notice that every single essay prompt has two parts and this sometimes um, students can get a little confused by this because they might wonder, well, do I get to choose which part of the question I respond to and leave the other one unanswered? The answer is no, you need to provide a response to everything in part one and everything in part two. Okay. So let's take a look at just what um, is included in the essay prompt. So if we go to part one, we'll see it has an, uh, three different questions here. What is Euthyphro's third definition of piety? How is this definition different from a second definition? How does Euthyphro's third definition make the discussion of the dialogue relevant for both monotheism and polytheism? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is not delve into what the answer to these questions are. That's for the lecture videos. But the point I want to make is just that when I go to grade your answer, there will be a certain number of points attached to each of these three questions. And so that means you want to make sure you provide a specific response to the first question and a specific response to the second question, et cetera, et cetera. So you just want to take a very detailed look at the prompt and make sure you're not leaving anything out. Let's also look at part two. Here's another way that my prompts often work. So two says, Socrates rejects Euthyphro's third definition. Explain how he does this by making reference to that passage where appropriate. So what's it telling you? It's telling you that one of the things you'll see in the Euthyphro is that Socrates says Euthyphro's third definition of piety is wrong. He does that in this passage from the reading down here. And so what I want you to do in this part is explain how he rejects that definition. And as I say here, I want you to make reference to this passage. That means what I'm looking for is not just that you can explain the necessary points, but that you can see how those points and how the argument arises out of this passage in particular. And again, in order to help guide you as to exactly what I want, if you continue to read this part of the prompt, it identifies three separate points that you'll need to cover in your answer. And again, there will be a certain number of points attached to each of these elements. So it says your answer should include discussion of one, the difference between essential properties and accidental. Two, should make clear why Socrates believes the property of being God love cannot be an essential property. And three, explain why any of this matters. Okay, so, and I, I want to highlight this because this points to a, a significant difference between the exam prompts and the prompts for the response papers. If you recall when I was explaining the response paper assignment, I said, look, those prompts have a number of questions, but you're not tied to having to answer all those, right? They're just there to guide you, they're to help you, they're to sort of help you brainstorm and, and get the, the writing process going. For the exams, however, it's different, right? When I ask a question in a prompt, it's because I want you to definitely answer that question, and that's just because the purpose of the exam assignment is different. 
The response paper, you're writing a paper where to some extent your voice is coming through and you're really concentrating on making a philosophical argument. But on the exams, I'm testing whether you understand certain um, core theories, certain core ideas that are found in the readings we've done this semester. So that means I just want to make sure you can answer certain specific and concrete questions. And so everything that is in the prompt must have an answer to it. Okay, so that's the approach you should take to these prompts. Now at this point, students often ask, well, how long should my answer be? And of course, the answer I can give you is one that might be somewhat frustrating. I can't tell you exactly how long your answer needs to be because there are many, there are different ways you could answer these essays and still have it be a good answer. My answer really just is long enough to make sure you answer everything that's in the prompt in a way that shows your understanding. Now that's often not that helpful of an answer. So one thing I have done is if you go back to the exam area of Blackboard, you'll notice I have this uh, document here which says sample exam essay. So let's open that up. So what does this document have? Um, so first it has an example of an essay prompt, but just so you're aware, this is not one that we're going to be covering in this class, right? So I have an example of an essay prompt and an example of an answer to it. This is an essay prompt I've prompt I've used in a different class, so nothing here is going to give away any material for the exams in this class. So that is to say, like, the content of this answer and this question is completely irrelevant to you. The content doesn't matter. But what this document will do is the following. It'll show you roughly what I have in mind for length and give you an example of what I mean when I say address every single thing answered in the question. Right, if you compare this essay prompt to this response here, you'll notice that every single question from the prompt gets a specific answer to it. Also, you can see something about length, right? If you look at this, it's maybe a page or a little more than a page single spaced. So that means maybe roughly two pages double spaced. So that's a relatively significant chunk of text and that makes sense, right? Remember, each essay question itself is worth 100 points of your total grade. That's 12 and a half percent of your grade overall. So this is not something you want to um, not put the time and effort toward. You want to make, if, if you're going to err in any way, err on the end of over explaining things. Err on the end of explaining things too much and making it too clear to me that you understand. Where you don't want to err is, un, is under explaining things. And this brings me to another point I want to make about grading standards. So to this point, I have largely been talking about completeness, right? Make sure you answer everything in the prompt, but of course I'm also going to be grading you on accuracy. And the way to think about this, sort of the mindset to get into when you're thinking about writing your responses is, I see the essays and the exam as an opportunity for you to prove to me that you understand the material and have mastery of the material. So that just is to say, when I grade your responses, I don't go in assuming you probably understand and then take my own knowledge of the material and read it onto your response. I just read what you put on the page and if it's ambiguous, if it's not clear to me that you understand, if things are underexplained or not well explained, then I assume that you don't understand it. Now that may not be true, maybe you do understand it, but the point is make sure everything you know about the material Right? Make sure everything you know makes it onto the page and you make it inescapably clear and you absolutely prove to me that you have mastery of everything that is being asked about in the prompt. Right? That's the sort of mindset you should get into when thinking about, well, how is, is the professor going to grade my exam? And I want to say one final thing about my grading standards. So this class and of course this exam is being taken online. What does that mean? Well. It means you have the readings and the lesson outlines and all the lecture videos available to you. And not only are those available to you, I encourage you to use them. I want you to use them in crafting your answers. In addition, you right now at this very moment have all the possible essays available to you. And so you could start preparing now. And in addition, there's an entire week of the course blocked out just so you can work on these essays. So you have plenty of time. It's a very different scenario uh, as opposed to if we were doing this in class and you came into class and let's say had one and a half or two hours to sit down and write out your responses from memory. That's a very, very different um, scenario. And because it's a very different scenario, 
my expectations for the exam are actually higher than if you were doing it in class. If you were doing it in class under time constraint with no access to the lecture videos or lecture materials or readings, then I couldn't expect that your sentences would all be perfectly well formed, that all your ideas would be perfectly well explained. I would have to lower my standards a little bit. But because you have all those resources available to you, and because you have a much longer time period in which to complete this assignment, I do expect a higher quality of work. And when I'm grading your exams, I'm not thinking, oh, this is someone who had maybe an hour to complete this. I'm thinking, this is someone who had eight weeks to complete this assignment. So it's very important to keep that in mind. One final thing to say in terms of grading. So this, I want to address plagiarism on the exam. So when you submit a response to one of the essay prompts, the assumption and the idea is that this is your own work. So first of all, it's not the work of another student. So if I find that you have submitted the work of another student or two students have submitted the exact same answer or an answer that is very similar and looks like um, it's an answer that was essentially shared between two students, if that is the case, then that would result in you getting a zero on the assignment. Also, if I find that you have copied text from the internet or some external source and used and put that into your answer, um, then that is also something that would be considered plagiarism. And even if you um, do use some external source, which you really shouldn't for this assignment, I really just want to see your knowledge of the material based on the readings, lessons, outlines, and lecture videos. But even if you do use an external source and you cite it properly, if you're using just a lot of block quotes from that source, um, then that doesn't really show your knowledge. So while it's not technically plagiarism, you also shouldn't expect to get a great grade. I really want to see, again, you put the ideas and the concepts and the arguments in your own w words in a way that shows your understanding. So again, don't feel, uh, for these answers, don't feel you need to use any external sources. You really shouldn't. Certainly don't copy material from the internet. And in addition, this is not a situation where you should be sharing answers with other students. I will look out for those things, and if they do occur, it will result in you getting a zero on the assignment. Okay, so I think those are all the basic points I wanted to cover about exams. Like always, if you have any questions, if anything's confusing, please contact me. Also, if in your preparation for the exam you're confused about anything content-wise, please reach out to me as well. I am more than happy to help and want to be there to point you to areas where your answers could use further development and help you understand the material. I really would love to see everyone do excellently on this assignment and see it again as an opportunity to prove their knowledge and their mastery of the material that we are learning in, in this class this semester. But with that, I will stop there. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.